Hi, everybody. Here we are past the deadline of last Tuesday the 7th. And I actually took a day off yesterday. I was going to be doing these evaluations into the evening and just try to get them all out of the way on the 7th. But, you know, after the deadline passed, uh, um, like the Pacific Standard Time deadline passed, I just felt, oh, geez, I, I need to get some rest. So I kind of went to bed and then just didn't get up until yesterday late. So um, <clears throat> anyway, I'm back on the job. So let's get rid of these evaluations, get them out of the way. And so everybody has knows what I think about their piece. And yeah, um, so we're starting off with uh, Alexander Price's score, and just a few um, a few comments. You know, some of these might have been caught on Facebook. Now, right here, you say first and second in French, um, and um, y you know you don't even need to do that if you're going to be doing the individual rests for each voice that is inherent in the part for both the copyist and the conductor. So the best thing to do is just to drop the rests below the staff in this case. You know, if you if your first voice is that if your yeah, you know, if your first voice part is that low, then the rest should be below the staff. And then if your second part uh, is this high, then it should be above the staff. So and then, so you can just just completely spare the necessity of saying first and second. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Cantabile goes down here with mezzo forte. Okay. Now you don't even need to mark mezzo forte because <clears throat> if everybody else is playing piano and the alto saxophone is playing mezzo forte, you're not going to hear anybody else because of the overtones of the sax they just are so bright. So if you just mark the alto saxophone P espressivo or P cantabile um, and put in some more um, like nuances, <clears throat> put in some some uh, um, hairpins in here to sort of lead the player around, then you don't need this mezzo forte here, right? In fact, it's sort of a redundant thing. So like here, I could see the alto sax part doing a crescendo here. And then the English horn coming in on mezzo forte when the entire orchestra had come up a bit, right? But I think that just saying mezzo forte at the beginning, it's just sort of like having a slightly cranky kid start, you know, singing um, some silly song in the back of the <clears throat> in the back of the classroom while everybody else is kind of like humming along to the teacher, right? So it it's just really has it just really will stand out. Uh, just what that is what saxophones do. Now, what I would say is mark everybody P, and then mark the French horns <clears throat> pianissimo, right? And let that be your uh, balancing, right? And you don't even need to mark, I mean, you don't even need to mark the English horn. Um, you know, if you did a crescendo here, you wouldn't even need to mark the English horn by much unless the entire orchestra did a crescendo. Okay, so this is kind of fun. You've got this uh, lovely little... Um, you know, kind of condensed harmony part here in the F horns. Uh, by the way, just to tell everybody, next, in the uh, next uh, challenge, I have really decided that everybody should submit a, uh, a, a transposed score to me because, <clears throat> like I said before, um, the irony of this is that I look at this and I think, you, you know, and my, my eyes... Like, you know, yeah, I might notice at the beginning sort of subconsciously that everybody is is um, in C, but, you know, I mean, I will just, I'll just like look over, you know, you know, I don't even look at the beginning as much anymore if I know that the score is going to be just a transcription of the same thing. And I just look ahead. I'll look at this and I'll say, oh, that's, you know, quite low for the English horn, um, you know, compared to where everything else is. And then, you know, and the same, it's the same with the alto sax, too. If this were, um, you know, I would I would be saying, wow, that is as low as you can get with an alto sax. And then, like, look over here and say, oh, right. So this is in the middle of its range because this is a C score. All right, so just, just give it to me transposed, okay? I can read it. I understand it much more innately and automatically than having to re-transpose back to C, okay? All right. It's it's just a you know, 
I shouldn't have a problem with that, but yeah. But, you know, English horn being an answering instrument to alto sax is a very cool idea. <clears throat> now, one last thing here is, all you have to do is just say P sauce. SOS period for sostenuto, right? You don't you don't need to mark out the full value of the of the pizzicato. You know, they will they'll get it, you know, that you are just you know, you're just just marking those. And actually the hall, as I said before on other scores, the hall carries the resonance of the pizzicato. The lower the pitch, the more the hall will carry the resonance. So you don't really have to mark out full value for the, you know, unless there's a real need to it. In that case I would say in either case Right, sauce, sort of pia, uh, sauce de nudo, just to just to really let the the players know that you really want full value, and you know they'll do things like they'll like vibrato on the note and and so on to try to try to keep the life to the of the um of the sustain going for as long as possible, but I mean it's you know it's kind of it's something that I I would actually just avoid doing really. There's kind of no need to do that. See now here. <clears throat> I would mark the full bar and then put a little tie over it. Um, and, you know, and you can say LV, which is uh, the French for let ring, um, which is just more of a standard, um, uh, more of a standard marking. But yeah, but in this case, I would just, I would just mark the full value of the bar with a, with a, um, with a tie over it, you know. So it's kind of the opposite advice as to what I was saying before with pizzicato. Okay, moving on. Um, yeah, so so here you take a very cool approach. Like I like the fact that you worked out how the uh, tonguing and slurring was going to work to go for the alto saxophone. Um, and then for the English horn, it's pretty good. Oboe, kind of same approach. <clears throat> yeah, so. Question that I have is if you're going da da da, why aren't you going da da? Right? Why aren't you slurring these two guys? Okay, and this is not going to feel like a um, this is not going to feel like a dovetail, right? As I'm sure you well know that this is going to really feel like the voice is pulling apart here. But I mean that's okay. This is interesting that you've got the bassoons at an octave, or the the first bassoon at an octave with, I don't know how many flutes are intended here. Probably just one. So that is a standard classical era um, pairing up. So it it actually might sound a little antique. Do you know what I mean? It might sound very um, <clears throat> uh, very seventeen nineties, um, as opposed to you know nineteen twenties. If you were going for a particular sound. But I mean, it still is a cool sound. I mean, Ravel, I think, did this once or twice too. I think one of one instance is in the um, pictures at an exhibition. But anyway, I, I can't remember the instance now. But yeah, it's a very cool sound. Bassoon reinforcing the uh, the um, the resonance of the flutes. So yeah, so I don't really see any huge problems here. <clears throat> okay, and. Um, yeah, so it's all working out pretty well. Um, so here you want a muted sound, <clears throat> and you sort of create a a little bit of a trap for yourself. And that is that, you know, you then you want an unmuted sound with the other instruments. And so in order to get all of these pitches, it has to all be one um, one group of strings that way you can take the mutes off and you can have the unmuted people come in however i'd like to point out to you that you you know you kind of have cellos like not doing anything why not do this first and seconds okay first and seconds come in muted then they back off all right and then the violas and the cellos come in sorry right at this point, okay, with doing basically what you're asking here. Actually, make this just the violas to VZ, you know, and then have the cellos do their thing, and then have, and this gives like four bars for the, um, 
violins to take their mutes off and then have the violins come back in here doing some of this right but <clears throat> chords like this are not really i mean you see ravel doing chords and things in across his groups a lot okay so this is this is doable but it kind of is suggesting that there's quite a bit more strings than usual you know um sort of like for daphnis and chloe you'd have a big string section um, so that they're, you know, because it has Divisi staves all the way through, right? So, um, you know, so you're, you're kind of thinking about the grand Ravel orchestra. Um, so anyways, there's, that's just a couple of ways that you can deal with this. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's early in the morning here. So yeah, um, high flutes. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears> hmm. <throat> So high flutes coming in, um, you know, and that's just is really quite a bit of flute in a row. You know, I'm, I'm wondering if there was some other way that you could have done this. Maybe, maybe this could have all been oboe, right in here. You know, or maybe this could have been flute, that could have been oboe, and then flute could come in again, just to have kind of like a contrast. This is kind of fun. Um, I don't know why you have to come in uh, loud staccato and then go boop 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 in or do boop, boop with um you know i don't know why i need to do this this sort of reverse swell here okay but anyways could be fun <clears throat> okay and then oboes pick up the game and clarinets see there really isn't a whole lot here that is wrong i mean it's all it's all pretty good you know i just uh, enjoying looking at it. Again, this has got to balance. You've got to really figure out what you want your horns to be at, right? Um, and it's a little randomized. Uh, there are not crescendos marked. So there's like no, like this is pianissimo. What is this? Like what's the dynamic here? <clears throat> and you're saying mezzo forte here. My instinct here would be that the horns would be at like maybe piano. So you could have a kind of a more backgroundy sound to it. Okay, and yeah, this is good. Um, there's nothing for the, there's nothing uh, tracking the oboe part here in the strings, and you could easily mark this divisi octaves in the uh, first violins. Okay, and <clears throat> never hurts to make this staccato, um, you know, the clarinet part and the bassoon part, if they are trying to match the, um, the sort of sense of pulse and motion of the um, of the strings. Okay, yeah, and yeah, here you can see <clears throat> that if this were marked transposing, or if this were score were transposing, then the horns would not be clashing into the trumpet part here. A cool trumpet solo. Okay, and here we go for the big payoff, the appassionata. Okay, um... You got the horns taking ah, you got the horns taking the lowest voice. And here see there's just too much weight right here on this uh on this uh second voice here. Uh the middle voice essentially. Right because you've got um second flute, both oboes it looks like or one oboe and both clarinets. Right? So what about poor little, you know, this thing here? Doesn't this need a little bit of string love? Right? You could have put the second violins down there. And, you know, the yes, the horn will outplay that sound, but it'll still, the, the resonance of the strings will still lend itself across the three octaves. <clears throat> Not a lot of scoring on the counter melody. Okay? Yeah, it's sort of dropped out and you know is this i right, see so you're saying horns one and three so this could be marked a two okay well that is a big sound um yeah i think that you could have taken the clarinets and had them play the counter melody or maybe the oboes right and just with the way that you've got the functions here um because it's just this huge weight on this line here below the top um yeah, the the sax is is a nice strong partner for the uh, 
for the counter melody, but but you know, just because the pianist incorporates or the piano score incorporates the first note of the counter melody into its part doesn't mean that you should leave it out in terms of a rest, right? Just put in the note, the first note of the counter melody so that we can feel the lines pulling apart, right? Okay, so and everything else scored pretty cool. <clears throat> I think that the the um, the brass should be marked forte here, which to everybody else is fortissimo, and there needs to be some kind of crescendo. Anyways, from here, it's obvious that you sort of just ran out of time, so a lot of the markings are um, are are sort of absent, and you know, things sort of tail off. So I mean, that's all good. I, I think that you just have a hell of a lot of triangle in this piece. Um, I think that it's charming when it comes in at A. I think by the time you get to B, people are going to be saying, uh, you know, that's quite enough triangle. And then it comes back in here, and then you've got this big triangle uh, tremolo. And yeah, I think that's just going to drive people crazy. That's just a matter of taste, not to say that that wasn't a tasteful thing to do, but it's just you know, a proportion, right? Part of taste is proportion. So it's like how much, proportionally, how much triangle can you put in a piece, you know, in terms of a timekeeper? Okay, so, you know, I, I'm i picking this apart and stuff, and like I do with all these scores, but I really like it. I think it's really fun. You know, you, you came up with a lot of ideas that I, I, you know, would never have occurred to me once again, and I like that. I like the fact that you used alto saxophone as the opening. I think that, I think Ravel would have thought that was really cool. So, hey, um, thanks so much, Alexander, and on to score two. Okay, so our next uh, arrangement here is by Tomas, and um, I would say just go have a listen to the SoundCloud mock-up of this, because it's really, you know, a very, very over-the-top orchestration, and that's not meant as an insult at all. It just really is you know, hugely involved um, and extremely colorful, extremely evocative on, you know, on every bar, there is something going on there. And um, starting from the beginning, which I would say, um, you know, just Tomas, just for your own, um, you know, for your own information, I feel that the marimba sound is too much like a xylophone there. Like if this were really played by a an actual marimba with, you know, um, you know, nice long wooden bars and um and you know nice long resonating tubes that this wouldn't sound so um um twee if you know what I mean. You know, it just it sounds a little too um um a little too sprightly um in terms of what you are adding here. But it still is a really nice touch. I I'm looking at this, and you know, in my mind, it all sounds pretty good. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, a nice little um, wind chorale to start off. Now, I just want to point something out here, and that is, I don't think you need contrabass clarinet. You know, you're not really doing anything to justify the contrabass clarinet here. And the cost to the orchestra that you're putting them through, just for, the, for just a teeny little bit right in here, um, you know, from here to here, and then that's it, right? I mean, I'm not seeing any... Yeah, I know there's a little bit of... Yeah, it just still doesn't quite justify it to me compared to the orchestra just playing these same lines with a contrabassoon, right? If you if you had something a little bit more featured... Yeah, and then you're just back to bass clarinet here. So, I mean, I think it's a cool idea. I love contrabass clarinet. And in a, you know, in a world where... Contrabass clarinet was cheap and readily available. I would say go for it, but I don't. I just don't think that it's like in terms of the budget of the orchestra. I don't think it's quite justified there. Okay, let me say one solo here, and it really does become a solo past here, but it isn't really quite a solo because of the, you know, because of the violin doubling here. Um. But yeah, but you know that would be the place to mark it. Um. Still. Um, and of course, when you get to here, even though you've marked it mezzo piano, um, you don't really get the sense of 
of independence of a real solo. You know, right here, it really serves more to underline what the first violins are doing. The first violins will come in here and the flute will sort of sound like this nice shimmering overtone above. In fact, it'll almost feel like this is a string line because of the, you know, so if that's what you wanted, then that's what you're going to get, okay? It'll, it'll work great from that perspective. <clears throat> and um, this was nice. The uh, reharmonization here, I thought that that was a nice original touch, uh, you know, along with the uh, with the horns. You could bring the horns up. I'm always keeping the horns down, but I think you could have brought the horns up here a little bit. If if you know everything is if this really is a solo, and you want it to you want its line to be heard as an independent line, then I would say this could be P, and then you could drop pianissimo in here. Um, yeah, and this is fun. I see what you're doing here with the, with the contrabass clarinet. I'd say that it's just, you know, you know, if you really do try to get this performed, make this into a contrabassoon and you'll get, and you'll get a performance. And here, um, <clears throat> Allegro Giusto, it really felt slow. You'd really want it to be like 160 or maybe 172 or something like that, just to... You know, just, it is a piece, it's a, you know, right now it almost feels like a minuet. It's, it's quite slow. Um, and then like, you know, it's a much more realistic interpretation of what the intention of the composer was to have it at a faster tempo. I've rarely heard it played at 138 by a pianist. Okay. Uh, moving on, E flat clarinet is coming up here. And this was nice. I have not seen many, if any, scores with E-flat clarinet in them so far uh, on this part at D, except for one or two, which we will mention in the Patreon evaluations coming up. Um, yeah, nice little idea for oboe. You know, you're doing this interesting thing, which is to drop an octave when it's time to, um, to dovetail and then have the other player take over above. And that's kind of cool, except that it sort of leaves a hole when you drop out. I see what you're doing right here. You are intending the clarinet part to sort of get swallowed into the strings. And it may not work as well as you think, so watch out for that. But yeah, um, just, you know, just for everybody's information, just the best way to dovetail is just right on one note. All right? And just like you do here. That's just the most effective way. I mean, this is a cool idea, though. Um, I would almost say, you know, for the clarinet to end on one of these string notes to sort of have the sense of being of it disappearing into, you know, I, I wouldn't really even be bothering mentioning this except for the fact that you have a crescendo, right? So the pungency of the clarinet is going to speak nice and loud, right? And then it's going to disappear and then it'll just suddenly not be there. So that is something that the audience is going to feel like, hey, what happened to that? Okay. But back to the um, E-flat clarinet with sleigh bells. That's kind of fun and a little glock following uh, an octave above. <clears throat> yeah, and, and, you know, this is all nice and icy, good icy snowy fun. Okay, and yeah, just, I don't really see anything all that impossible or out of place. This is nice, the horns doing their little thing. And, um, yeah, your your sweep here, I like the fact that this was harmonized, and this is nice too. Uh, the cellos and the first violins tracking at octaves with the trumpet on top. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so very nice. I mean, what, what was nice here was that you, you didn't overly reuse um, certain instruments or certain elements without having something to refresh the texture in between them, right? So when the instrument came back in, you know, here you got oboe, for instance, and you had used oboe over here. So by the time we get back to oboe, we've heard so many other colors that it's like, oh yeah, that's nice to hear that again. <clears throat> okay, um, I would say just one word of advice here is you know, here we have a full 2T page, right? Okay, um, you could, you should just leave this full 2T going on for the whole score, okay? Because, you know, the eye of the, 
of the conductor is going along here and then they see like oboe and they might if they're just if they're slightly careless in their reading they might think oh wow or they might be reading this solo for the the clarinet and saying oh and then all of a sudden what is happening here right so it's better just to leave like a nice full pages you can cut out the percussion right when the percussion when you don't have three lines of percussion or something you know or glockenspiel and marimba you can cut those out but sort of try to leave the um the brass wind and string groups sort of intact uh, in a situation like this, okay? Especially like if you're, if this score is going to be read um, in a very, you know, kind of a rushed way, if the, if the players are only going to get like about an hour to um, perform or to, sorry, to rehearse and the, and the conductor is only going to have about an hour. All right. Um, <clears throat> so this is a nice build, but you, it ends up sounding a little stodgy in here. I hope you won't take that as an insult, okay? But it sounds a little stodgy in here. And I feel part of that is just because there's a little too much middle weight to the counter melody, okay? And there is a lot of weight on the, um, on the bass line. And, you know, I, you know, here is a situation where the contrabass clarinet may be actually working against you a little bit. Yeah, you know, whereas if this was bass clarinet doubling the bassoons and this were a contra bassoon, um, I think that it would be less, um, you know, it would it would just it would be, uh, you know, it would fit in a little bit more. It wouldn't sound quite so, um, you know, quite so heavy. It just really set, sounds very heavy compared to all of this beautiful light radiant scoring that you've had before, and then all of a sudden we get this, and it's just it's it's Wagnerian. Um, in its in its feeling, you know, it doesn't really quite feel like that. You know, has that it doesn't have that wonderful light French radiance to it. So yeah, so um, I I think it it really comes down to the trombone here, putting putting so much weight right right there <clears throat> in the middle voice, right uh, when you've already got uh, you know a two horns. I think it's quite enough, you know, so just that one loud, loud instrument is enough to kind of just really make it, you know, like soaked cake, you know, is what I felt. So, um, yeah, nice cool down. That's all fun. Okay. And then here comes the marimba again, uh, doubling the trombone. See, now here's a good place for the trombone. This did not weigh it down at all, you know, with bassoon in the background uh, or supporting. That was really cool. And, um, yeah, yeah, so, so I, I feel it all works pretty well from that point on. A nice little, um, nice little artificial harmonics, which I feel are, is kind of giving away a little bit. You keep kind of giving away a little bit of the ending a little bit early. Um, yes, because, because, like, here they come back again, so, hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it could be foreshadowing, so that could be, that could work good. Um, and look, pianissimo, really, um, you know, if you just want a little bit more color and a little bit more weight to the cello solo, then it, you know, it would, it would work better as like bass clarinet or something like that. But the trombone is going to be indelicate right? It's not going to have that really beautiful, delicate sound. It's just going to be very heavy, uh, even even as a soft sound, you know, behind the behind the cellos. The cellos are going to have some weight to them, all right? Um, yeah, and see, this could be just tenor clef. A B flat doesn't need to be in, um, in treble clef. I would save my treble clef scoring for the cellos um, if they were, like, centered around C D, E at the top of the staff, rather than, you know, if the, if the highest note is a B flat, you know, that's just only, you know, that's only about like uh, three lines above, or two, yeah, two lines above the uh, tenor staff, so it doesn't really, yeah, I don't really need it. Um, and, you know, this ending is really, really cool. It's very, you know, so this is, this is very cinematic scoring. <clears throat> I think it's extremely competent, 
And, you know, I feel like I'm more coaching you, like if you're getting this ready for a show, than I am really saying, you know, giving you instruction on how to orchestrate things. So, you know, I mean, I, I really appreciate you scoring this and taking the time to do it. And yeah, I mean, you know, you've got some great ideas and you've got a really cool sense of proportion to everything. <clears throat> just, you know, just think about think about the balance and the quality of the tone of some of your tutees. And, um, and I think that you're going to be fine. Okay. So anyways, great score. Really enjoyed uh, looking at it. Uh, let's go on to score number three. Okay, so our third score, our middle score in this uh, challenge uh, video comes with, once again, a um, uh, score in C. Um, yeah, so just to remind people in the future, give me a transposed score. You know, if you are in Sibelius, there is the ribbon at the top, and you just hit the uh, the little transposing score uh, button, and it's just easier for me to read because I'm used to reading transposed scores all day long. So, uh, and and you know, and and in essence, you should be thinking that way. You should be learning to read and just absorb it, you know, and 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 know what everything what everything means the way the player reads it. Okay, um, really fun little score. Uh, I think that there is a lot of very competent scoring happening here, and um, just really is fun to watch. Now, uh, with with all that said, I would say that there's a sense of protection here. Um, now, here you've got different functions in the different voices of the strings, and that's really, really nice, right? As strings and winds. So, you know, for instance, this A-flat is taking over... Um, from like the when, when the um, left hand goes up to the fifth, right, right here, okay. Um, so so that's all nice. Now when the music gets a little thicker later on, um, it becomes more of a protected score. It has very protected scoring. So like you know, there's lots of doubling on everything. Um, you know, whereas it would be easier to. Um, to kind of hear the different colors if they were not doubled quite as much. Okay, so that's that. That would be my overall critique for the the um, for the orchestration approach here is to try not to double different functions and different voices too much. I mean, uh, some is fine, but but it'll it'll sort of rob the colors and the individualities of the lines at times when you want the functions to be nice and. Um, nice and vibrant, right? If they're, if they are always doubled, if they're always sort of protected, they don't have as much life to them, right? They're, they, they can have a nice, thick, warm, beautiful sound, but they won't have as much, um, as much color springing out, okay? So I'm not going to harp on it, but, uh, but yeah, okay. And the other thing too is you do not need to mark your solo lines louder than the rest of the um, than the rest of the, the instruments. Okay, just mark um, the same dynamic in a situation like this and just say P, Espressivo, and Solo at the top, right? And that way, like, because Mezzo Forte is just really, you know, you, you, you think, oh, this is going to be a nice stronger voice while everybody else is being hush-hush. But the truth is that a Mezzo Forte sound is a, is like a very blah sound even for an english horn it is like a it's it's like you're sort of telling people don't be quite as loud here because somebody else has got something going on and we want you to sort of blend into the background it's really the the primary purpose of mezzo forte and then you yes you can use mezzo forte to ask a um ask a player to stand out more than the rest but you know you can ask this player to stand out more than than his companions um just by marking solo over the top and marking it the same dynamic as everybody else. Now, here's another problem here. I'm seeing this a lot. People are marking a kind of a dynamic approach and then saying simile. I think you can't do that. I think you really do have to mark the same thing, all right? Because, like, you know, it's all vertical. It's very vertical reading um, at times. And if the... Um, <clears throat> If the conductor has sort of sees something over here, and then they then the, then the player continues to do it, 
you know, they might actually not actually read this simile thing. They might be expecting to see the same uh, hairpin on every single uh, on, on every single note. And it won't hurt your playback if you just, just write P diminuendo, P diminuendo, P diminuendo four times in a row. That's that's fine. It's totally fine. Don't worry about it. What I'm more worried about is the fact that there's no um, there's no nuances here in the English horn. Now I will give you credit for marking. Um, you know, a really nice uh, tonguing and slurring uh, idea. I think that's great. That is great. People were just not doing this. They were just putting a big long line over it and leaving it up to the player. This is really, really nice. Okay, but you really still do have to say, you know, I mean, what is the player going to do? Are, are they just going to go, duh? Or are they going to go, you know what I mean? Are they going to say something? Are they going to lead the line with their expression, right? We just really have to show the players what we want them to do, how we want them to express things, right? And as the as they reach up for this high note, look, even you, you even acknowledge here that the violas are going to need to get louder. Why not this night? Why not the solo line, right? Why shouldn't they just like really open up into this, you know, as the line gets higher, right? Shouldn't they open up into more and more force, right? And also the thing is, if you're still mezzo forte here, then you got nowhere to go but forte, right? And that's way too loud for everything else here. That's just another argument not to just automatically mark two dynamic degrees up on all your solos, right? Okay, I'll stop harping about it. Okay, uh, yeah, and this is nice. So there was a crescendo here, right? And you forgot to put it in, all right? So just really, I mean, the focus of your attention when you have a piece like this and there are lots of solos in it should really be on what is that line saying? How can I just really, really make it clear to the player how they could express themselves? How could they could sing this, right? Because there's no, there are no lyrics here, so so you have to sort of imagine that there are certain words that you want emphasized, you know, the imaginary words, and that's what you need to use your hairpins for, right? Your little crescendo and diminuendo hairpins. I wouldn't be bothering to lecture you like this, Anna, if I didn't think that you had a great orchestra orchestration approach and that you just you know that your orchestration could really take off with you know you know just just a little bit of coaching you could find you know maybe you could you could turn this scoring into just much more you know stuff with much more life to it and, and for instance here you don't need to mark p and then pianissimo for everybody else right everybody be pianissimo it's fine right but this first line could just have more nuances, more hairpins in it, right? Just just obviously the players will know that they are leading the line, right? Now, here is what I mean by a protected approach, right? So you get up to the top of this line and then you double with the oboe automatically, right? And then, you know, and then you add the clarinets doubling the second violins. So there's there are a few more instances of this where just like you know, you are adding a little bit of color to it, and that's very, very cool. But I want you just not, I want you to not have this be your default. See, I wasn't actually even worried about this, but then I looked at this and I saw that essentially the, you know, the clarinets and the violas were doubling each other, and then the bassoon was taking over for the, with the violas. Um, so we're kind of losing some of the individualities of functions that were so nice at the beginning. You know, so I mean, look, it is fine to double things in strings and winds. Don't get me wrong, but I just want you to not default to it when you want a bigger, when you want a bigger sound and a bigger texture. Um, and now here, you know, when you set up this idea that the the audience is going to hear da 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 da, right, and you're sort of setting a precedent with the way that things are phrased. Okay, and now here you're going. Da, da, with the strings, right? So is that what you want? Because here you're having the oboe using a different phrasing model than the first violins. So you may not have thought this through, right? I would say everybody do the same thing. And maybe that's boring, but I think that at least it sets up the, there's a continuity, right? With the way 
that everybody is playing these phrasings, these little these little slurs and everything. And also, you have to think that you're basically saying down, up, down, up. Right? That's basically what you're saying with the bowing here. All right? Couldn't you do something like down, up, down, up, down, up? Right? That would be one way of dividing the slurs a little bit more. Or you could just do the same thing as you did with the the oboe and the English horn. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Right? And then there would be some sense of continuity to the phrasing. All right? But you shouldn't do this. Right? So this is a very specific kind of phrasing here in the oboe. And it's just not really much of any kind of... Um, you know, any kind of uh, respect to that, right? So it is not going to be a very seamless doubling. It's going to feel, you know, the, the audience will hear that there are two people doing something. Whereas if you wanted a blend, that would be another thing entirely. And also, once again, no nuances, right? Nuances? I want nuances, everybody. Okay, um, now this is interesting. Flutes come in and they, they're it's really nice. This is a beautiful color, and you've really, really backed off on any kind of accompaniment, and you go all the way down there to C flat, right? But B flat is a Tchaikovsky thing. You cannot score a B flat for flute, right? This note is out of range. So, so my suggestion to you is, since this is so weak, really, um, is if you want the the perception that you have that your second flute player is going to go low lower than possible then make this bottom line here into a uh, clarinet part okay so just have the clarinet come in here and the sort of the kind of fluty sound of the clarinet um, will will give you the illusion so I would say just like second flute play this note which will be dov doubled, dovetailed into by the clarinet here, right? And then you will maintain the integrity of this octave, all right? Cool idea to put an octave here, by the way. And once again, you don't need to mark it up. See, so look, you've got how many different dynamics here? Pianissimo, piano, mezzo piano. It would be better for it all to be marked pianissimo, right? And, and maybe the flute's marked P. Um, you know what I mean? It's just, it seems like there's a lot of tweaking. Once again, okay, I'm going to tell everybody this, and that is that the players don't read each other's parts. They don't know what each other have, and they are used to playing with a certain kind of um, section integrity, right? So if, you know, one player has got a part that's marked piano, and the other person has got a part that's marked mezzo piano, in this case, it's okay because the, you know, the players here will think, oh, yeah, no, that guy's got a solo, so that's fine. He's playing a little louder than me. But let's say that you just really were worried about one player being louder than another, and they're both doing harmony parts, right? Um, and you, so you marked one down and the other one up. Well, the one who's marked down will hear to the person, hear the person who's playing a little louder, and they'll say, you know, I should probably be louder because, you know, I've got a P on my part, and they don't know that the other person has a mezzo piano, right? And so they'll think, oh, well, you know, this is sort of more of a mezzo piano dynamic and everything, but, you know, that person is really knows what they're talking about, so, right? So, so I'm just saying, just don't tweak things so much, right? They try to have overall integral dynamics and have the functions of the of the instruments guide you in terms of what are the dynamic balances so you can mark everybody p right and then still get a beautiful dynamic balance all right now here this is strange mezzo piano on a low e flat going up to f and mezzo forte for the oboe right now this is a very weak note up to G is very weak, or from G downwards, I should say. This is extremely weak for the flutes, whereas this is very pungent. You know, it's a very strong, um, you know, very strong note for the oboe is an E flat. So basically, nobody is going to hear anything from the flutes until about right here. Okay, so it's just maybe rethink that. Now, of course, you're being doubled by both sets of violins. 
right? So it's almost just like not even like the flutes are not even needed until about right here. Okay. Um, so moving onwards, I like the way that you've harmonized these these um, these little guys going up to the up to the melody. These little sweeps up. Okay, and this is kind of interesting. There's there's just the you know just the top line. There's like no doubling below you know by octaves or anything. That's cool. Okay, <clears throat> now we get to here, and that is um, that is pretty cool. But uh, yeah, so okay, so you've got a quadruple octave here. Okay, and the quadruple octave has got support on its top two voices from the flutes. It's got um, extra support by the clarinet on this second voice, right? Okay, and the cellos have got like no support. Now, wouldn't it be better to have this line here an octave lower? That way you've got flute, second flute, clarinet, right? So flute, second flute, clarinet, and maybe you don't need any support on the bottom line, all right? But right now, this middle line is actually going to be the strongest because you've got two wind instruments on it and just one on the top, right? So, okay, and um, yep, so just very tasteful little bits of harp here and there. That's kind of nice. Um, so counter melody is okay. It's okay. I, you know, it would have been nice to, you know, you could have stuck the counter melody all the way up to here because see, look, the counter melody has got, it is actually up there in between the top two octaves, right? Or the, the to the, the octave above, it's right in between there, right? So there is no, you know, there's no note up there. So you could have had this line here, the second line played by, uh, by the, oboe, and then you could have had this high E flat played by the second flute, right? So the, there are ways around this. Um, yeah, because you've already got the clarinet. Yeah, see, the clarinet and the, and the oboe are basically, second clarinet and oboe are already doubling each other there, right? You know, I mean, what do you need that for? You don't, right? So I would say this turned to first oboe, or there's only one oboe, turn this line into this upper, this upper thing so it's integrated, right, so that the parts are inside each other, right, and then English horn is fine where it is, and um, viola could actually be be playing octaves, divisi, so that there's more string support to the counter melody, right, there's just a lot of different ways to do this, um, but anyways, I mean, it's, it's cool, like, and you've got the, you got your horn here, kind of playing the middle line um, uh, as, sorry, sorry, the bass line, I meant to say, at a very high pitch, right? Um, you know, so it's sort of like this becomes a triple octave, this bass line. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I feel like the bass line has already got enough strength to it, but I, I see where you're worried about here. If you're worried about it, then drop the horn an octave because the horn can actually play way lower than you think, right? I mean, it can go all the way down. You can play this G flat an octave lower. So you could use the horn as another bass instrument if you wanted to, without putting so much of the bass line in the middle, where really in the middle, you need more of the counter melody, right? You need more strength to the counter melody, right? As it is right now, this horn is going to blast out the sense of counter melody in the center with the English horn, all right? And, you know, nice little cool down. People are being pretty respectful of that. This is a really high note, right? You have to think, this is A flat being played at mezzo forte, very, very exposed for the bassoon. Now, it's, it's a perfectly possible note, but it will really stand out. And you've got this, once again, very protected um, sense of doubling everywhere, right? You're doubling your melody in your second clarinet, with the second violins, and you're doubling the melody for the bassoons with the violas. So these will just these will sound like sort of thicker, juicier string lines, right? 
rather than really the, the sense of the wind instrument coming out. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think you could do a little bit better here than just cutting and pasting or copy and pasting the piano part to the har harp, okay? Just think of, think of things you could do here to have the harp be more of a harp line, right? Um, yeah, so, you know, the rest of it's pretty good. You don't have to say ah one, okay? It's ah two means with two or one or two, right? So don't say ah, you know, with, with a single instrument. Just say one if you mean the first instrument. Say two if you mean the second instrument because you're setting yourself up for a trap, right? If you say ah one, then when people, when you say write ah two, which means with two instruments playing at once, it, what if you met with the second player, right? Then nobody can tell, like, that's, this is where the hand goes up in the rehearsal. The, the player will say, you know, like, if this, if this somehow makes it its, its way past the copyist, they'll be saying, well, wh what's going on here, right? Or the copyist will write to you or send you an email and saying, what do you mean, you say ah two somewhere else, do you mean with the second player or do you mean with both players, right? So don't say ah one that way leads to madness, all right? So just say one or two. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, once again, just doubling all of the lines with the, with winds and strings, right? So, I mean, it's a nice approach, but there's just a lot of it in this, um, in this piece. And it does not mean that you get a beautiful sound of, of winds being kind of individual and the strings happen to be along for the ride. What you end up is getting usually the the strings and the winds will balance together so it is a it is a, a thicker, juicier string line. And you really should you should, once again, when you have wind and string doubling, try to have a similar phrasing approach for everybody. Okay? So look, I really picked on the score a lot, um, but that doesn't mean that I don't like it at all. I'm actually really impressed with a lot of the approaches. I think they're really great, they're really sound. I think that you are doing really interesting stuff there, Anna, and um, you know, and keep at it. Like I wouldn't bother wasting this much time on the score, which is not a waste, but I mean, wouldn't bother spending this much time on the score if I didn't, you know, if I didn't think that my advice um, wasn't going to be used. I think that you've really got a lot of potential and um, I'd really love to see you participate again in our next challenge um, in a few months. All right, that's all for this score. On to number four. So our fourth score is by Gustavo. And I really enjoyed this, especially because, as a lot of you know, I'm a big supporter of the bass clarinet. And it was really neat that you, you know, instead of writing a Shalomo register clarinet solo to start off with, you did a bass clarinet clarino register solo. And, you know, there really is a difference between those two. You know, the, the bass clarinet in the clarino register will have a certain character to it that, um, you know, it, it has a certain kind of brightness in the same area that the, you know, the clarinet would have like a darker color. Right. So there there and there's something almost flute like about it, almost like it's, you know, like a something that can play in the low register of the flute and sound like the flute, but not be as weak as a flute. So anyways, I, I really think that this is cool. You mark espressivo, but you cannot trust the player to come up with exactly what you want. You have to write it in. Right, so espressivo means what? You know, where do you put little hairpins to show us what you mean? You know, in terms of the um, of the line being expressive. Right now, interestingly, you have it um, the harmony supported by horns. That is very cool. Um, nice. It's going to be a nice uh, a nice textural support. I think that's very cool. And then you just have very simple cello in here. I would say like maybe put a staccato here for a little bit of lift going into the, you know, going into it. Bum, bum, bum. And here you have a nice, um, nice dovetailing going into the English horn part where the line gets strong. Okay, uh, and yeah, just make sure your English horns, uh, sorry, the English horn stays in front of the French horns 
and you shouldn't have a big problem. But yeah, but otherwise, this works pretty well, and, and I liked it a lot. Um, there are some tweaking things that you could do, but, you know. Then here you come in with this nice, you know, ba -da -da -dun, you know, and then ending up with the clarinet here. I think that is a really cool way to approach this. Okay, and then just leading to second violin, pianissimo, with the viola supporting on the harmony. Okay, that's all good. Now here, you sort of have this doubling, and it's the line's going to get a bit strong here. You know, um, now you, you could easily have just like come in and not added the first violins until right here on this note, right? Or maybe here. So, but yeah, but, but doubling for like a bar and a half makes the line thicker. It doesn't necessarily provide like seamless dovetailing. Okay. And especially if you're doing A2 on the oboes, it, it doesn't matter if it's pianissimo or not. This will have a more trumpet like sound when you do A2 on oboes, okay? You could just do a single oboe there. But, you know, since everybody is all playing together, could be A2, could be fine. Yeah, and then you've got this, yeah, just pretty much kind of a more standard approach with clarinets and bassoons, providing support with just a little bit of harmony at the end, and then the, um, and then, you know, the harmonic support coming from the seconds and the violas, and you're adding some you know, adding some doubling there with the lower strings. That all works pretty well, I, I've got to say. And then you've got your little boom chuck chuck, boom chuck chuck with the English horn. I like it a lot. Okay, and now piccolo in its like sort of more vaporous register. I think that works pretty good. You know, I, I, I want to say one thing too, that, you know, even though I've scolded you slightly about uh, about not having nuances in your solo parts, I think that this that it's cool that you divided the breathing and the slurring. Okay, I think that that works out really well. There's only one little issue, and that is you're sort of like not really being settled on one approach, right? It's like so here you've got da 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 da. Now here you're going da 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 da. Right, and then here you come in instead of like doing first the one way, then the other. Here you're doing da 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 da. So I think I kind of have to sort of settle on one or the other, or else it sort of calls attention to itself. Right, the best kind of slurring approach that you want is one that like just doesn't even get noticed, but adds to the the sense of expression of the line. Just you know, just is just feels completely natural. But anyways, uh, enough of that. This is really nice. Um, da, da, da. I, I think that's kind of cool. And I like the um, dovetailing here. That's also very cool. And you, you almost did not even need... Um, you did not almost did not even need to have the, um, the strings come in here and double the flute. Because as soon as they do that, you lose the sense of individuality of the flute, right? Um, like maybe the strings could have come in here instead of all the way back here, but it's just a thought, you know, because this is such a nice idea of these guys in the background with the with the piccolo just sort of tootling along in front of them. It just was very strong, and I feel here it gets weakened by the doubling of the strings. Now here, you know, do you really want the strings to go da 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 da, or do you want them to be more naturally like da, just one bow ba or da da. Or da da, you know. Okay, um, and then some similar approach here: the harmony in the background. Now, okay, here you are asking. Hang on, I want to check something. You have one oboe. Okay, so you're asking one oboe and one clarinet to double together, which is a sort of a, a Schubert sound. And then you have just the English horn all by itself come in and finish the line. It's you know. In this case, I would almost say like you might you're you're better off just with the oboe coming in and then the English horn coming in under it because that is a reflection of what happened before with the piccolo being tied off by the flute. Whereas with this, you get kind of a more intense sound that will go to a less intense sound. Now, by intense, I don't mean louder. I just mean that there is more complexity to the timbre of the of the line. Okay. All right, and then here, same thing. Don't there need to be slurs here? 
da or da or da da or da 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 or da da. You know, there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. Okay, and this is fun. You're coming back now. See, this is good because you have avoided doubling strings and winds for the most part in this sort of second episode. So here, flute doubling the violins, it's nice. It's so so now you get like a very firm color and the violins taking the lead here. And um, yeah, and good support from clarinet. So, you know, I just wistfully look at the rest of this and think, oh man, if you're just like maybe tightened it up or polished it up a little bit more in here and then added your Al Argondo section and the cool down. It would have been such an awesome, you know, I would have loved continuing to read it. So you left me wanting more and that is great. And, you know, just like I was saying before, partial uh, entries are fine, right? And in fact, like in the future, I might only be offering partial entries on Facebook because if I, if I have a longer piece that's say like, you know, this piece is only a minute and a half long, so that was perfectly fine to have complete entries. But, you know, if I, getting into like a three-minute piece, I just really, you know, it might be like a Patreon thing to do like a very long evaluation and more of a Facebook thing just to do the first minute or two. And and thinking about it, you know, how many could 80, 80 entrants, just like, you know, we had 80 people, 81 people participating, could all of them, you know, possibly spend you know weeks and weeks to come up with three or or days and days to come up with uh, three minutes worth of orchestration so you know, I don't I don't know but I don't I suspect not one last little thing I would write solo above these these things just to really let us know that it is a solo okay um, not over the strings but like say here a two soli if you're gonna do a two there Maybe not here because they're doubling the strings, but you know, when you have an exposed line like this with the piccolo, I would say I would write solo over there and just really let the player know that that's what their job is. It'll be pretty obvious by the context, but it'll just save time if you don't have to explain it. Um, all right, so very cool. Thank you, Gustavo. Now on to our last, uh, our last score for this batch. There will be one more batch of four more scores for the Facebook entrance. Okay, thanks very much, and on to the last one. All right, our last um, entry for the Revel Challenge for this video, which is Evaluations L, and there will be an M, as I just said. Um, the last one here is very interesting. It's, it's very economical. It's um, doubled winds and then four horns and trumpet. And, and yeah, and just, and it's just really fun. I mean, I love this little, you know, dun, 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 dun. you know, it's just, it's nice. I don't think you needed to sort of spread it around like this. I mean, it, it, it'll make a, an interesting effect going across the orchestra, you know, just jumping, like if the, the violins are, on, the first are on one side and the seconds are on the other side of the orchestra, then it'll be a nice sort of handoff. Um, it won't make much difference if the first and, and seconds are sitting next to each other, which happens a lot nowadays. Um, and and you sort of keep that going if throughout this first uh, exploration uh, of the theme. I thought that was really nice. And this is very cool too, uh, just handing off. Uh, and, and you picked a great note to hand off on, by the way. That F is just perfect. Because if you went any lower, then the oboe would be getting very strong and would be very have a mark would have a more marked difference in timbre to the bassoon, like a bassoon on a B flat, say. You know, that would be like one of the strongest notes for the oboe, and it would be a sort of a paler note for bassoon. But by waiting for it to be this F, it just is it just is a perfect, you know. Uh, not perfect, but I mean, it's a much better note to hand off from a bassoon to an oboe in, in if you want like a, a dovetailing effect. Now here, the clarinet comes in to do like the um, the harmonization of the melody, and that's very cool too. Um, and, you know, that, that works pretty well. Going back, and then you pick, once again, uh, E-flat and this E-flat, and then that's just, you know, that's really a nice way to come back okay i like that a lot and then you keep your horns in the background when you go into this next episode uh there's next the 
reiteration of the theme in Octave Higher. Um, you know, clarinets doubling with violins or a single clarinet doubling with violins, it'll have like a cooler sound. You know, it'll make the violin sound cooler, but it won't really, you won't really hear the violins or the clarinet standing out from the line. There'll be a nice textural blend here. And I like the, um, I like the horns here. You have to understand that they will add a slightly um, soggy, slightly static element to the music here. Um, you know, they're the warmth, the glow in the background that you get from horns like this, the price that you pay is always just a slight feeling of inertia. But you're you're you are, you know, you've got some really nice support here, um, you know, and and nice you know nice rhythmic pulsing going throughout it, and that's really good. And you know, look, you are paying attention to my um, to my lecturing about people adding nuances to things. This is a little predictable, but it's still pretty cool. It's better than not having it, right? And this is nice too, the way this comes together here. So yeah, so so nice. But why why no nuances here? All right? There's just a crescendo towards the end. Okay. Well, anyways, I like the way that you have uh, octaves here in your you know you go to octaves here with the cellos and the and the violins and that is going to be a very um a very solid very passionate sound um you know of of the of the two brightest instrumental or the two brightest um string groups you know uh violins going up the e string and cellos going up to their a string those are those are like the two you know the two most potent ways to state something with strings and and it's nice to have them in octaves and just let the seconds and the violas be the middle voices that's really cool and you know it makes sense with the with the horn accompaniment that you've got there so i like that a lot um and you know that just kind of goes on and and it's it's nice the way that you cool back down here to go to the uh the next theme and you know the the little boop boop boops boop 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 that's cool and then um this is, you might have heard me talk about this. This is a little tricky. Um, you are asking the oboist to play, you know, to start cold from a high E flat going up to an F, right? Now, this is doable with a really, really good oboe player. With a not so great oboe player, it's going to sound a little squeaky and squawky up there. Um, so, you know, this would be hard on, I would say, like a semi pro, uh, maybe a regional player to just start cold on that high E flat going to the F. And, and it's also not a light. It's like, you know, it's you know, once you get down to D and lower, um, it's not so bad. But, you know, like to sort of like lightly trip along with, you know, with elegant fleet footed little grace, you know, that is not what you get from a high E flat and an F. OK, it's just it's it's a it's a much harder place to control things. So, yeah, so, you know, it's it's just a little out there. I would say if you had really wanted the oboe to start here and you wanted to kind of remove all doubt, just transpose everything down to, you know, down a step or two. If you really had to have this oboe solo in there and you wanted it to be foolproof, right? Um, so like if this were in the key of C major, for instance, that would be, you know, that would be uh, D, right? Uh, and so on. So they're just, they're ways of making it a little bit um, less scary if you were working, say, with like a student orchestra or a semi-pro orchestra. Uh, but it doesn't, you know, it's not impossible. It just worries me a little when I see that. Okay. Um, yeah, and then just like oboe, clarinet, strings answer. Okay, and then, oop, sorry, I skipped this part in here. Okay, um, this is interesting. Dun, 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 dun. So do, are you sure you want that? Dun, 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 dun. I mean, that's kind of, actually, it's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah. Um, now, this is a little powerful. I'm just going to point that out to have both string groups playing. You know, you have to understand that that's going to be 30 players on a single line, you know, with a standard orchestra. Well, everybody else is going do 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 do, and you've got a crescendo there, so the players may think, "Oh, geez, am I going to mezzo forte here?" So you have this really big sound from the from the uh, strings, which will suddenly become a solo trumpet line. So there might be a feeling of just almost too savage of a contrast there, 
right? So watch out. It is that you know the the um the sense of projection here will match the strings though. Just that single trumpet will will be balancing to a string line that's played, you know, say mezzo forte or whatever, whatever how whatever the string players think they're going to be here. Um and then here, yeah, I just really feel that that like there's something missing. Like if you're going da dun dun dun, it might be nice to do that same thing here. Da dun dun dun. Right? So just put a slur across the first three there and keep it a little bit consistent. And I like this this in here that you got the um, the second clarinet and the uh, Divisi viola playing the same line. I think that's really cool. And that you've harmonized this. Okay. <clears throat> and um, octaves here, played by first flute, second oboe, and then the little harmony in the middle. Yeah, this is all working pretty good. Okay, and then you have your big appassionato. Um, oh, and look at this. Hmm. A nice big old slur from the upward sweep. Now, why wasn't that in previous places, I wonder? Okay, so just really think this out, all right? Just, like, really make sure that you're making the right choice when you have a line like that or a, or a, little, um, a little bar like that. Um, generally speaking, though, yeah, your, your phrasing is pretty good. Um, yeah, definitely... Um, you know, definitely thought out much better. And I do like the sense of intertwining here. You know, you've got the, uh, in both flute and oboe, you've got the melody on top and you've got the counter melody played by each second player. And you just went for like just big string octaves here on the melody. And that's, that is, um, that is doubled throughout. Now, now see here, I, th I feel that you're really asking a lot of the bassoonist. Um, just like, you just really want them to, to play this high thing. And they will sound fine, but they're not going to really balance, right? If you have the horns playing off four, right? You, if you have them playing the counter melody, this massive sound right in here, nobody's going to hear the bassoon up in its most quavery weak notes, right? So like, if this, however, were played by clarinet, say you had... Say you had second clarinet and bassoon playing this, uh, playing this part in here, this uh, bass line, or you had the bassoon. Sorry, the um, okay, yeah. So let's just say that. All right. Let's say you had the uh, bassoon basically playing an octave here, um, or just like just have two bassoons on this note, and then um, uh, second clarinet playing this doubling of the bass line. And then had them play like the um, this line here, then there would be a chance of it being more audible. But I think just the way that it is scored, there's just too much weight right on here for this bassoon line to be all that effective. And and really, it's this is kind of more like a delicately accompanied solo register kind of um, kind of writing as opposed to like big tutti writing. It's just a weak place for uh, a tutti line for the bassoon. Anyway, um, aside from that, passage works pretty well. Okay, so really enjoyed looking at this, Dylan. It would have been nice to, you know, take it further and hear you finish up this, uh, this little arrangement. But I'm, you know, I'm happy to have partial scores. I think that that's great, you know, and, and it actually helps me to focus in, um, you know, it gives me more time to talk about fewer issues. And, and, you know, that way I can just give more attention and say more about why things work or don't. So anyhow, um, great. This is, this was really awesome. Five more composers um, getting evaluated, and there are going to be four more in the final evaluations M uh, for the Facebook entrance. And after that will come the Patreon videos, some of which may be shared with, um, you know, with the rest of YouTube and some of which might be private. Just to, it's up to the, it's up to the individual composers, whether or not they want their extensive lessons shared. All right. Thanks very much. And on to the next video.